we worship this evening according to the abbreviated service of the word on page 38 in the front of the hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Our Old Testament lesson for this evening, these selected verses from Judges chapter 16. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. And then she said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything. She sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. And she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our epistle lesson is from Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. 
The Holy Gospel is written in the 8th chapter according to St. Mark and begins at verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. The congregation is invited to join in singing hymn number 512. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text from the book of Judges, tell me the secret of your great strength. We began this year within these same walls, singing a hymn. It became the theme of our school year. In Christ alone. The secret of great spiritual strength. We learned where it comes from. In Christ alone. We learn where it does not come from, ourselves or anywhere else. Children, young 
and old. Marvel at the mighty deeds of Samson. Samson during the period of the judges. You may think it has something to do with that long hair of his. But Samson's strength was no more in his hair than David's power was in his sling. You know from the Bible by now that that long hair was the mark of his Nazarite vow set apart by God from birth to serve God. It was an emblem and a token of the strength that he had in Christ alone. During this period of the judges, the Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They were bad times. God disciplined his children of Israel because of this. But in his mercy, he also sent judges or deliverers, men like Gideon, Samson, Jephthah. Samson is surely the most famous of all of these great judges in the Old Testament. He is the one we remember for his great strength. We are astounded. It takes our breath away when we read of how Samson, on his way to Timnah, sees a lion roaring at him and coming toward him. And the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came on him with power. And he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. Perhaps Samson himself was surprised at what the Holy Spirit was doing. The gifts he was giving. How should he use this gift from God? This superhuman strength. He doesn't even tell his parents about the episode. Later on, when Samson is deceived by the Philistines in regard to a riddle at his wedding reception, he loses a bet. And the Philistines tell him he's got to pay up with 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. So Samson goes out, you may remember. He gets 30 sets of clothes by killing 30 other Philistines. Now, you must remember that the violence which Samson executed upon the Philistines was not simply some sort of personal vengeance on his part. He was chosen of God and directly assigned by God to be a thorn in the side of the Philistines and to defeat these enemies of God's people. It was his calling from God. Well, later, Samson finds out that they have killed his wife and father-in-law. In retaliation, Samson, you can hardly picture it, he rounds up 300 foxes, ties their tails together with a torch in between, and sends them all scurrying and frenzied into the grain fields of the Philistines and burned up their crops. In retaliation for this, the Philistines come back with another murderous plan. He, in turn, kills a bunch of them, and he goes into hiding as one of the most wanted in the area, hiding in the cave of Edom. But then, the men of Judah hand him over to his enemies. Samson allows himself to be handed over to the Philistines, kind of like someone else we know who allowed himself to be bound and betrayed. And as the men of Judah lead him up to the Philistines, at Lehi, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson with power. And he snapped the ropes like charred flax, like a strand of hair put to a flame. And he grabs the jawbone of a donkey and he slays 1,000 Philistines. 
And then, as he was prone to do, makes up a poem about how he made donkeys of them all. And you can almost imagine the reaction of the Philistine commander back at headquarters. He killed a thousand of our guys with a what? But Samson has a downside. More and more, he has been using his great power in the service of himself. The Philistines have been watching his sinful habits. His godly parents have warned him about the kind of company he's keeping, the kind of girls he's hanging with. We see it when Samson goes into a city, Gaza, to spend the night with a lady of the evening. The Philistines are watching. Once Samson's inside the city, they lock the gates of the city. They'll wait till morning to arrest him. Samson says the Bible rouses himself up in the middle of the night. He goes forth. He grabs the gates of the city. He rips them out of their stone foundation, hoists them to his shoulders, carries it to the top of a nearby hill, and sets them down. And so when the Philistines show up to arrest him in the morning and to open the gates, there are no gates. And while we might chuckle a bit at the antics of this muscle-bound, overgrown, juvenile delinquent, there's something we notice. The sacred text does not say that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. More and more. Samson is becoming like other men. The Philistines can see it. They know they cannot defeat this man with brute force. But they know also he's becoming his own worst enemy. And so, they hire a call girl from the valley of Sorek. Her very name breathe sensuality and deceit, Delilah, the longing one. As an operative for the Philistine army, her job is to wheedle out of Samson the secret of his great strength. And so day after day, she nags and cajoles and whines, tell me the secret of your great strength. And the big strong man toys with her. Well, you know, if, if they tie me up with seven bowstrings that have never been tried, I'll be as weak as any other man. And of course, she playfully does it. But the Philistines are waiting in another portion of the house. And she cries out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! And he gets up and snaps them like threads. She keeps it up. Tell me, tell me. Well, if you tie me with new ropes, never been used before, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! And he snaps them again. And one more time. Well, if you were to weave the braids of my hair into the loom and the fabric and tighten it with the pin, why, I'd be as weak as any other man. And so she does it, and she cries out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he gets up and carries it all off, loom, fabric, pin and all. But Samson is getting worn down. The words of Delilah are tiring him. Words like, if you really love me, you will tell me the secret of your great strength. And finally he caves in. No razor has ever touched my head. If my head were to be shaved, I would be like any other man. This is not about the hair. It is about his token 
of a heart and soul dedicated and given fully to God. He's broken his covenant with God, the one that God made with him. And so she gets the strong man to sleep, his head upon her lap. A Philistine enters the room with trembling hand cuts the seven braids of hair from Samson's head. And Delilah calls out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you! And he thinks to himself, I will get up and go forth as at other times. But he couldn't. And one of the saddest lines in the Bible, he did not know that the Lord had left him. He should have noticed it, how he was edging God out of his life with other loves, other loyalties, other passions and pleasures. He should have noticed that God was getting up to leave, heading for the door, hovering over the threshold, leaning on the doorknob. He should have noticed, but he didn't. And all of a sudden, God isn't there anymore. He didn't know that the Lord had left him. The Philistines cruelly gouge out Samson's eyes, bind him with bronze chains, place upon his shoulders the yoke of an ox, put him in the Philistine prison house to go round and round crushing and grinding grain like a beast of burden. The blind Puritan poet John Milton wrote an epic poem about this account called Samson Agonistes. He portrays Delilah showing up at the prison house, talking to Samson, trying to take some of the blame and so forth. The Bible, of course, says nothing about such things. But there is a telling line that Milton puts on the lips of Delilah. She says, Ere I to thee, thou to thyself wast cruel. In other words, before I ever did anything, you did this to yourself. And now outside, the prison is the cackling and the laughing and the ridicule of the Philistines who believe that their God, Dagon, has now overcome the God of Israel. The sins of believers are the bulwark of unbelief. Or as St. Paul put it, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In other words, our sins darken not only our own reputation, they blacken the name and the true reputation of God and give unbelievers the alibi and excuse they've been looking for to ridicule Christ and his teachings. The Philistines are not done. They hold a big festival to their god Dagon, statue half fish, half man, at the temple of Dagon. They holler, all oh, praise to Dagon, bring out Samson as a trophy of Dagon's victory over the God of Israel. And they make sport of Samson, and they make him play a clown, if you will, in front of the whole multitudes of the Philistines on the gallery up above and down below. Samson is led by a lad to a part of Dagon's temple where the blind strong man says let me feel the pillars on which the temple rests the big pillars that supported everything he pauses there was Delilah there did the little lad run off to the hill country of Dan to tell what was going on One last prayer. Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me, O God, please strengthen me just once more. 
and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. One more prayer of repentance, of turning to God, that God would remember him. It isn't just about his two eyes. Samson is the leader of Israel. It has to do with the Philistines, the godless against the godly. One more time, even if it costs me my life, that I may bring honor to the name of the God of Israel, and bring judgment upon his enemies. And he calls out as he leans against the pillars, Let me die with the Philistines! Did every head turn? Look! Suddenly a hush. Samson bows himself against the pillars. Silence. And suddenly, creaking, crumbling, reeling, crashing, the entire temple with the thousands in the gallery come crashing down. Thus Samson kills more when he dies than during his entire lifetime. Samson had his strength in the end, only in Christ. You know, his parents named him Samson. Sunshine, that's what it means. Must have hurt them deeply when clouds rolled in over their boy's life. When they saw him forget what he was born to be, a servant of God, dedicated body, heart, and soul to the service of the Savior who is coming. It must have hurt a great deal. We understand what it's like. There's a little Samson in each one of us. You know, things are going well. We're healthy, prosperous. Maybe got a little money in the bank now. And all of a sudden, we start crowing about it. We start thinking that our health, our wealth, our success, all the good things that happen to us in life, that these are somehow ours. We take the credit for it. We forget from whose hand we have it. We forget in whose service we are to use all that we have, all that we are. We forget that we are the baptized sons and daughters of the king. And as a result, we start to edge away. Oh, you know, you skip a few Sundays. No big deal. But then, you know, a few more. Oh, but then you're there, Christmas, Good Friday, Easter. And then pretty soon, those other voices, they seem more familiar to you. The voices of the Philistines. The voices of the Delilahs. The voice of God starts to seem kind of odd and strange to you. And you didn't even notice, you should have noticed, but you didn't even notice that you'd cross that line and you maybe didn't even know that the Lord had left. But the Bible teaches us that he who laid down his life and slew more in his death than in his life and said, I have power to lay down my life, but unlike Samson, I have power to take it again. The Bible teaches us that our vows can be renewed that our faith can be restored, 
that the pardon we received in our baptism can once again be recovered, that we can begin again, that like the prodigal son in a far country who has gone away from his father, he always invites us to come home again, that he loves us with an everlasting love, and that we never again have to ask, well, where is the secret of strength in life? Where is the secret of getting home to God? Where is the secret of staying faithful? We know that it's not in us. We know that it's not in our own strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, says the Bible. Myself I cannot save, myself I cannot keep, but strength in thee I surely have, whose eyelids never sleep, in Christ alone. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the singing of the next song. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you see our young people growing up in an uncertain and confusing world. Send your Holy Spirit into their hearts that they may grow in grace and wisdom. Give them strength to resist temptation and courage to meet the challenges of each new day. 
Show them that following you is more satisfying than pursuing selfish goals. Make their unique gifts and youthful vitality a blessing to their families, to the church, and to all others their lives may touch. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The congregation is invited to join in singing hymn number 511.
people wherever and whenever God gives them the opportunity. I'm reluctant to see these young Christians leave our school, but know that they leave with God's grace and that we will spend eternity together. These words of mine, I'm proud to present, they call New Delta Lutheran School, class of 2012. Luke Patrick Frederick. Kate Elisa Pat. Seth Anton Lenny. Wendy Jean Nirvana. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
Following the anthem by the sunshine singers in praise chorus, the congregation will conclude by singing hymn number 752 in the worship supplement.
welcome our visitors and invite you to sign the guest register. We are thankful and we are pleased to announce that Mr. Payne has received